Okay, welcome back guys. Um today we're gonna talk about a little bit of the Arc Viz world, uh building shots for interiors. Um I really like doing interiors. I have a big background in building interiors for retail and also arch architectural visualization. So but you know, I'm not building out a whole space where um, you know, I'm getting plans from an architect and such. I'm building this as more of like in the mind of a product shot or like furniture. Right. And so like, if you're familiar with like a lot of furniture makers, they make really nice product shots of their furniture in different settings. And so that's kind of the mindset that I'm in for these shots. Um, again, I have a lot of experience in the arc biz space, building interiors out and also some experiential design. So I've learned a lot by osmosis to take spaces and information and, you know, create a quick uh, development shot or some kind of design, whether it's interior design or um, experiential design activations. So with that being said, getting into this shot itself, um, you can see that I'm only focusing what's in the frame. OK, and I want to walk you guys through just some of the modeling process and also some of the um process of creating the materials and then the process of lighting and then rendering itself too okay so let's start off with the modeling part okay so let me switch here and then we're going to zoom in you know what let's back up a little bit i want to talk about a little bit of my organization because i've mentioned that before and i've mentioned that i've have a process where I use a template file. So as you can see here, my template file is being used more in the manner that it should be. Um, when I'm doing those very isolated particle shots or abstract shots, I tend to delete all these uh, collections and then just add new ones based on the elements in the in the shot because it's about like three, four, five elements in those shots. But there's something like this. This is where my template comes to life. So like here, I can start you know, adding these elements into my uh, accessories. So we got a rug. I'll just put it in fixed floor for now. And then I could take these elements, put them in accessories since those accessories, X, Y, Z table, that's a fixture. So this is how I can just quickly organize my scene. So I have fixed floor, which is for like furnitures that are on the floor, furniture that's up against the wall. So maybe this painting, I believe the artwork is up against the wall. So I hide that, you know, I got my artwork, stuff that sits on the floor, right? We got the drinks on the table, so I can hide those real quick. Vegetation also down here um, and anything else. So like I have a mannequin one if I'm doing some retail space and other things, you know, then I got my architecture too in blue. So cameras, lights, CAD is all yellow. Sometimes I'll add like simulations, a simulation layer. And so that would probably be in the yellow section. Architecture is blue, fixtures, furniture is green, accessories and product is pink. Uh, people, mannequins is this orange color. And then vegetation and site plans is purple. And then sometimes when working on projects, you know, I'll have a couple different options. And so whatever changes, whatever needs to be changed out in the scene, I will create different options for those elements. And so I can be able to quickly hide those and rebuild them again. OK. All right. So let's talk about the modeling. Um, I don't model a lot. I tend to avoid modeling. I know like in the 3D space, people will say, oh, well, it's not a real project you did because you didn't model the whole thing out. Well, I don't believe in that kind of philosophy. Um, would you if, if that's the kind of philosophy you, you live by, then like you would have to start everything from scratch. So the most modeling I do when it comes to these kind of elements is building the architecture out. So I built the architecture out. So we got the ceiling walls and trim and floor. That's it. That's all I needed to build for the shot. Right. Set up some walls and floor ceiling. OK, the windows. I actually got these windows from a different scene. Um, and then the lip here, I think I built this or maybe it's part of the window. This was an existing model, existing model existing model so everything else that you can see is an existing model uh this picture frame i built a long time ago so i just have it in my assets library so i can quickly grab it out um i do have to give some credit this this window and 
I would say this exterior element out here, this is from Johannes Lindqvist, if I could say his name right. He's a great, great, great CG artist. Um, you could check his work out at elusiveimages.com if I if that site is right. But you can look up elusive images and his stuff will probably come up. But he's a great artist that works in 3D Studio Max using F Storm. Um, and so I'm really inspired by his work too when I see it. So anyway, that's where I got these models, the window and this exterior element so that we could have some context of the exterior. And then for the chairs here, I got these chairs uh, from Blender Kit. I believe these are Blender Kit chairs. And then the drinks and the, oh, the chandelier is also Johannes. The drinks is from polygon.com. This is from Dementsova, if you guys are familiar with that website. Um, these plants here are Polygon. Um, so if you guys are familiar with these elements, a lot of these elements are free. Just, you know, they're free elements to where you could quickly, you know, sketch something up. And so this scene itself, it only took me, uh, I would say two hours to build. And then it was just setting up the shots. Okay. So there's not much modeling going on. I already had a profile to use. Um, so I duplicated this profile, just extruded it around. All I had to do was just have a 90 degree corner. And then the walls you can see here, I like to add chamfer to walls because, you know, when you're building spaces in 3D, we don't necessarily want perfect corners. We don't want these 90 degree corners. When you look at stuff in the real life, um, th things don't have perfect corners. There's roundness to them. So if you do a little bit of observation, you'll catch these things in your own house. Um, the ceiling is actually not showing up in the shot. And so I don't even have any kind of detail to the ceiling. OK. All right. So moving on to the next thing uh, and talking about this. Oh, let's talk about the box. OK, so the reason I have this box, too, is because I am creating a box to contain all of my lighting. So when we talk, get to the lighting stage, I'll start explaining why I'll, I'll explain quickly why I have this boxes, which is because I'm creating a enclosed space for the lighting because I'm on a light with the HDRI. And then you'll see also see some other elements here, which are bounce cards and then my walls, of course. So let's move that back. OK, so let's go on to talking about um, what should we talk? We should, we should talk about the materials. OK, so walking through the materials, we'll switch over to our shader editor. And everything is very simple here. It's not complex. So I have a simple shader. The walls are pretty matte, have a pretty matte finish. I am using one texture to produce all my different maps. Um, it's a little bit more optimized when creating simple shots like this. I don't need a bunch of different files to be referenced for the scene. So I'm just using a concrete texture for the walls itself just to give it a little bit of texture. Um, on these on these walls and then plugging it through um, having a little bit of control of how much that variation in the color shows up and then for my reflection I'm using a color ramp so that I can control the amount of reflection and the variation of it in the roughness map and then just a little bit of bump that's it so that's pretty simple my floor material I'm using airway wood textures they're high res textures they're great to use um, using a mapping node back here. Um, and then over, I was using, I went through a lot of different iterations of woods and this is what I ended up with. And so this wood map is pretty simple. The simple arrowway wood that's, uh, what you call Chevron shape. Um, very dark. So I, again, using color ramps so that I have some control over how reflective or how matte it is. So like I can pull this up. Now I got more matte finish to it with some real, with some uh, variation in the reflections. Or if I take it this direction, now it's gonna become more reflective. And so we can see what that looks like. And so that's what I ended up with, you know, and then I actually changed the color a little bit more gray. So it's not completely black and then a bump map also. And so when I'm working with the bump map, I tend to like get real close because sometimes when you're working with bump maps, it'll look good far away, but up close, it'll look terrible. So I get real close and then I start playing with the bumpness, the bump map of my uh, texture. And so the strength is very, very low. It's 2%. So like if I go 
10%. Watch how bad it looks. Okay, so you have to be careful of this sometimes when dealing with bump maps. You want to get up close to see what they look like versus trying to determine your bump map back here. So switch this back to 2%. Uh, again, using a color ramp, so I have a little bit of control if I need it. Um, I did, it doesn't, looks like I didn't do much to it at all, but I just wanted that control if I needed it and make more edits. Um, Over here, I have a gamma. What did I use this for? Let's get rid of it and just check what happens. I don't think that's doing much, but I, I think I, I was controlling the level of darkness this map had. So like if I turn it to two, it'll get a lot darker. If I go like 0.5, it'll get a lot brighter. So I think that's what I was doing. I was just playing with that. Then I just ended up back at the default. So um, other materials. So this material here for the table, I use another map. So the default of this table was, I think like a gold finish of the legs. And then the top was like a Corian white finish. And so I wanted to do something a little bit more exciting to kind of just relate the colors to this painting over here. And so what I did was another texture um, from polygon.com. Um, if you go to their free assets, they have a, um, I think this will be called a terrazzo. So this is a terrazzo finish that has colored speckles in it. And so that's what I wanted to use for this texture map. Um, pretty simple, plugged it all up. Um, they provide all the different maps diffuse uh diffuse roughness bump and so on and then you just plug it up and set everything up like you want it so it does have some reflection um and that was it pretty straightforward so let's see if i can pull it up real quick matter of fact okay actually i don't know what's going on here i'm a little bit lost but that's okay it's pretty simple pretty simple map it doesn't have to be complex it gets the point across um, the plants, they already come in with their textures on polygon.com. Both plants are polygon again. Um, this right here, matter of fact, maybe I should add the terrazzo finish because there actually isn't no finish on this right now that I'm looking at it. So let's see what, there we go. Okay. And then I'm going to add like that and then we'll make an edit to this. So we're just going to do an edit live. I'm going to switch over to UV mode and then isolate it. Go to material mode so I can see it. Then we're just going to scale it. So I'm actually going to remap it. So we're just going to do a smart UV project. And then I want it bigger. So we're just going to scale it down so the texture map can be close to what the table is like that. Cool. So we got that done. Did a quick texture edit. So we got the terrazzo on here and let's zoom back out, go to solid. We'll switch back to our layout mode and we have that fixed. There's no material on it. So let's wait for it to render. Cool. Now we got that. That looks great. So we got this and this over here. Okay. Next thing, glass. We could talk about this real quick. So for this glass material, it's pretty simple. It's just some transmission. I was playing with some colors. I also have um, Shader Plus installed, but I decided not to use a Shader Plus material. So if I could show you guys real quick, Shader Plus is a great add-on for Blender and we can use glass. So Shader Plus, glass, let's right click matter of fact, add Shader Plus and then glass presets oops shader plus glass presets and we could say let's try one with uh caustics and dispersion so we'll try that so i could take that plug it here in the surface instead of the one i have currently and then oh i'm in the wrong slot so let's go to the proper slot we'll go to the proper slot So right now it's set to the filament. That's what we have a set to right now. Um, I'll, uh, switching over, talking about the filament right, I, before I switch over. I just, these, these, I had to turn the strength way up to get it to show up into the shot. So as you can see, the filament 
is on. So this model has so much detail that it has a filament, which is great. So like if I'm doing like shots with a lot of bokehs in them, this filament will be highly exaggerated, which is great. So it's a cool little feature that you can add when, you know, you have these highly detailed models, you can add little details like that. And then I also, for the filament, I put a black body node so that I can also, also add some color to temperature. Um, so by default, you know, it's just white, but I want it to be a warm filament. As we all know, lights uh, with filaments, they're a lot warmer. So if I was to go 6,500, you know, it'd be white. If I go above that, it'll start to turn blue. Right. Right. So you're seeing a little bit of blue here, but I wanted it a very warm color. So let's go to like 3000. If I even go lower, like 2000, it'll start to turn red. Right. So now we're getting like reddish orange. If I go like 1000, very, very red. Okay. So that's how you can work with color temperature instead of trying to guesstimate the proper color. You can use this black body node to plug into your mission or anything else to get the proper color temperature for your lights. Okay, so switching over to this glass dispersion, uh, let me add that shader plus node again. I can show you guys how that works. So it's, again, shader plus node is a really, really cool um, add-on for Blender that you guys could check out on Blender Market. Um, it adds features to where you could have dispersion, caustics, faster caustics, other such things to into your scenes, okay? Now why, it, oh, th I know why this is happening because it, these caustics are very, very sensitive. So if I turn this all, all the way down, so now it's going away because the, the way it's plugged in, it's 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 set up in a, such a way that these can render very fast, but sometimes they can be very sensitive. So you have to be careful with the caustics and these shaders sometimes. But if you test them out on their own and kind of project, um, um, if you project light through these glass materials, on, on a isolated scene, you can really see how these caustics work. So let me try adding dispersion instead. So I'll show you guys the dispersion level. So now we can see like we have dispersion. What dispersion is, is the light bending through the glass. So as we all know, like, you know, there's a spectrum spectrum of color. So that's what's happening here. You're seeing the those spectrum of colors in the glass. And so it it's rendering, it's cleaning up but it's shader plus, but I decided not to go with it. I just decided to stick with the default, keep it very clean. Um, and that was it. So let's move on to the next thing and talk about uh, lighting. So for lighting, let me close this out. Oh, let me switch this back to 3D, 3D viewport. Okay, talking about the lighting. So for lighting, what I did for this scene was use a HDRI. So sometimes initially I'll start off with putting a light in the window and moving on with that. But this time I wanted to play around with using HDRIs because, you know, you get a lot more color information in your lights. And sometimes the suns that come out of the HDRIs are pretty nice too. So I love the way that the sun is washing across this wall. Okay. And so I'll show you guys my setup for that. So we'll go back to the shader editor and we'll set it to world. Okay. And this is my node setup for my son. Okay. So as you can see, we got the output and then our first input is our background, which is the strength of the light. And then we have our gamma and I'll explain why I'm using a gamma. We have our uh, texture which is being referenced. And then we have our mapping. Okay. Oops, switch back. Okay. So in starting out when creating a light or HDRI setup, you have to use a environment texture. Okay. So I take an environment texture, I hit open, and then I go and find my HDRI that I want to use. Okay. So the HDRI I'm using is this for Roth, it's back in 2013. I've had this one for a long time. It's an EXR file and I plug it up and then my HDRI will light the scene. Okay. So by default, the H, so by default, you know, this is lighting with a white light right now. So I'll just turn this off just to show, actually let me turn this to zero. And now it's just 
my light here lighting the scene. Okay, so if I plug this up now, we'll see that the HDR is plugged up. And if I set it to one, we're not gonna see anything. Okay, so we're getting a, just a tiny bit of light in the scene, but I have to really turn it up. So if I go four, we get some more light, eight, 16, 32, 64, and I ended up at 128. Okay, so simple as that. That's how I ended up with the light in the scene. Okay, so now that I got my HDRI set up, right? And you can see that it's lighting the building outside too. And this is part of the reason why I wanted this HDRI so everything is congruent with each other. So my building's being lit out there because I have a lot of different camera shots, which I'll show in a little bit and walk you guys through my camera shots. My wall's being lit. And then the reason I have this gamma node, so the gamma node, what, what helps with the gamma node. So back in 3D Studio Max, I used 3D Studio Max for a long time with V-Ray. And what we would do with our HDRI is using V-Ray to control the intensity of the sun. We use gamma. So we change the set settings in our, our, of our gamma. So like if you want a very intense sun, right? You would change the gamma to 0.75, right? Here in Blender, it's the reverse. So if I go 1.25, you will see that my sun gets more intense. So that's how you can easily control the intensity of your sun, right? If you want that to be uh, more accentuated. So I, I can even go up a little bit more, see what 1.5 does. So, so you see how much brighter this sunlight gets. So that's what you can do. So you can set it to one if you want more of just this balanced default look, or you could set it to 1.25 to increase it. Right. And so we'll just leave it there for now, just for the video. And then print playing with the brightness here. So I can set it to 256, find something that I like. Right. And then I'm going over here to my render settings down here to color management. I can play with the contrast. Let's set it to punchy. So now it's a little bit more uh, evened out. Or I can set it to like very high contrast or very high contrast right here. Very high contrast, which is what I had it at. You know, so I play with these things. So I play with my HDRI, then I go to my color management, set that right to where I want it. And then I can also go here to play with my exposure if I want it to, right? But I kind of like to play and get this right here over my on my strength for my light. And then I'll go to the exposure. So the other thing too with this setup, I add a uh, mapping node along with this texture coordinates and this it's set to the default settings. Um, if you guys have Node Wrangler, all I did was press Control T. So if I disconnect this, I'll show you real quick. If you guys are not familiar with this, so Node Wrangler is a default add-on that you can add uh, with Blender and set it up. So if I hit Control T, right, I get my mapping coordinates. Okay, so let's get rid of that. Add this one back in, and so here you'll see that I'm playing with the rotation. So by default, it's set to zero. So right now the sunlight is coming right through the window at 90 degrees, okay? And what I'll do when I import these lights is I'll just start rotating them uh, in 20 degree increments just to see what happens, right? So 20, we got 40, 60, right? Now we're hitting the wall, right? And so like I go in between, what's 50 do, right? And that's how I found this angle here, you know, or if you want to go bigger increments just to see what happens, you could do bigger increments, right? 180. Right. And if you like something like this, right, say like something like this, where the lights, not the direct sunlight is not coming in the room and I want to take advantage of just using the skylight. Well, if you like that. Now I can just come back over here. And if I just want to even things out a little bit more, now I can go over here, start turning up the brightness of this and just take advantage of the skylight. So I can turn it up to like 1024, right? And then just start playing with this, right? So this is looking pretty nice. Seeing how my scene's lit, right? It's very bright out there. The sun's probably hitting that building, which is why it's disappearing. But I'll go back to my original settings. So that's what you do. You get the HDR in. You want to set up a couple things. You want to have control over your rotation. You want to have control over the intensity of your light. 
and then you want to have control over the brightness of your light, right? So those are the sim this is the simple setup for a nice HDRI here in Blender. The other thing I like about Blender too is just how it handles light. So with this AGX, new AGX uh, co color profile, it handles light really, really well. Um, it's very hard. I wouldn't say it's very hard, but it can be tough to get results like this quickly in other software such as 3D Studio Max using V-Ray. I would say Corona would be better choice to get a look like this or even F-Storm, but using V-Ray, it could be tough because they have not really caught up in terms of using proper color profiles and, you know, having it so visible. There is a way to do it, but it's not very visible and it's not talked about much. All right. So that's the lighting. Um, oh, you know what? We need to talk about one more thing for the lighting. So for the lighting in the scene, I have a couple bounce cards. OK, so if we look here, let me switch to 3D over here that I can walk you guys through and then go to wireframe. So if we see here, I have a big bounce card. OK, so I have a bounce card here. The ceiling is a bounce card, and I believe that is it. And let me move these to my lights over here. Okay, so I have two big bounce cards. I have one for the left of frame. So there's a bounce card off of frame over here on the left, and then there's a bounce card right above. Now I'm going to turn them off, and you're going to see what happens. Okay, so as you can see, the scene just got a lot darker, right? And that's because this light is coming through the window, which is our key light, and it's just going off into the void, right? So what I want to do, because this is so dark and I want to show a little bit of lighting, feel light hitting these products, I want to bring bounce cards in. OK, so the first bounce card is here on the left and it's just bouncing light back into the scene from the left to right. OK, so the light's coming in here and then it's bouncing back off the bounce card back into the scene. OK, and then on the ceiling, I have another light, which, you know, the lights coming in here again and any indirect light that's going anywhere. It's hitting that ceiling so that it doesn't escape and it's just flooding the scene with light. So instead of adding more lights to your scene, right, what you could do is you just take advantage of using bounce cards. And all it is, these bounce cards are just big planes with white materials on them. So I set my material at 0.8, make sure it's ha it has a matte finish to it. So I turn the roughness to like uh, one. And all you have to do is just add these planes in and then you can just sit here and move them around to find what you like. So if like I'll show you an example, extreme example of how bounce card works. So if I brought it into shot, you can see how the light is just bouncing right off. Right. See, see how bright this wall gets. And if I move it back, Right. You can see how dark it gets. And then if I hide it, you'll see it get real dark. So that's the ben benefit of using bounce cards in your scene. So you could add a nice, strong key light and then you add your bounce cards. OK, only time I would add another light is if like I wanted extreme control over, you know, how my lighting's coming into the scene. But in photography, you're all, you're limited to the amount of equipment you can use in the real world. And so. The equipment can be expensive. Buying buying strobes can be quite expensive. And so, you know, small studios have less lights to work with. And so what you do is you take advantage of using bounce cards. You control the light by, by bouncing it around. And so this is a, a approach you can take in 3D to control light and create a natural look that looks uh, similar to photography. Because in 3D, we tend to want to add more and more and more lights throughout the scene. OK. So I actually have one more light here, too, in the scene just to show you guys. And this last light is just a what you call a kicker light. A kicker light is just it's almost like a fill, but it's not a fill because a fill light will usually like fill the whole scene. But this kicker light is for the purpose of being behind camera because I have foreground objects. And so these foreground objects, I don't want them completely black. I want it just a little bit of fill so that I could pick up the details of this chair. Um, and this viewport runner, you can't really tell, but when I post the high res, you'll see that there's a little bit of luminance on these chairs just so that it's not completely dark. 
All right, next thing. So my cameras. Okay, so my cameras. So the way that I approach doing cameras is I approach doing cameras instead of adding multiple cameras, I will actually animate my cameras for different shots. So I know this can be a different approach, but to me, this is a highly beneficial way to do camera work instead of having multiple cameras and, you know, having to manage all these different cameras. All I'm managing is my keyframes. So I'll set a camera and I'll keyframe. I keyframe the position, the rotation, um, and not the scale. So I just keyframe the position, the rotation. And then if I'm changing the focal length and also depth of field, and then I also have a focus point, right? So I've talked about my focus point that I always use. So I'll move the camera, set a focus point, set the depth of field, and then keyframe everything. And so from there, the reason I do this is because I don't have to sit here and batch all my cameras to render them all out. All I have to do is render one camera and I just render it as an animation to save everything. So as you can see here, these are my different shots, all right? We got shot zero, we got shot one, all right? We're looking out the window a little bit. Shot two, shot three, and shot four, all right? So the other thing that I'm doing too with these different shots, just to make it a little bit easier, I'm not managing a lot of different scenes. I'm also animating my furniture. So if you look at this top down view, my furniture is being animated too. And so my furniture are actually just links, right? I have a, a asset library. I don't need to mess with the materials. All I need to do is bring the furniture in and set up my shots. Okay. So for each shot, the furniture moves around. That's right. It's just simple keyframing, right? And it's very easy to manage, right? So that's it. That's how that's how the scene was built. It's pretty simple. Um, you only want to focus what's in camera. Sometimes as us as CG artists, we want to build the entire apartment, right? And then we want to set up the shots. That's not the case, you know. If you if you ever uh, see photography sets with stuff like this, all you'll see is something like this, right? You only want to focus what's in frame. You don't want to focus building a whole thing. And then, you know, now you're rendering, you just want to build a quick set, set up your shots and then you're done. Okay. So even looking at these shots, you're getting the feeling that there's more in this place, but there's not, it's just a, it's just a set. That's all we have here, right? You want to build them as sets. OK. So that's it. Just wanted to walk you guys through. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Um, I love doing interior shots like this. So I'm going to do some more. I have another interior that I built, too. Uh, it's an apartment. And that one's more of like a whole apartment floor plan that I built out a long time ago. I just repurposed it in Blender. Um, so I'll do another video showing you guys that also. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I'll be sharing more videos and that's it. See you later.